PCN534, which is antenna theory and design. Uh, so we will start today's lecture with the Shanti Mantra as usual. Let me share the screen. Is the presentation visible at your end? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, so we will start the Shanti Mantra. Om Purnamadah Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachyate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Avashishyate Om Shanti 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 Thank you. Uh, once again, welcome to the class and uh, we were looking into antenna introduction, so we will just briefly quickly cover whatever we have covered in the previous class and then we will move on with the rest of the remainder of the class. So we are looking into, uh, into before beginning of the class, is there any clarification that any of the students want in the previous class? No, so I think it's clear to most of you. So we will anyway brush up now and then we will take up the remainder of the class. So we were dealing with antenna parameters, uh, namely the radiation pattern. That's what we were dealing with. And uh, in the radiation pattern, basically radiation pattern is a graphical representation of, let me use a pointer here. It's a graphical representation of radiation properties of an antenna. Very often it is the amplitude pattern which is plotted. Amplitude radiation power pattern is what is very often used. And it's very important to note that the radiation properties are plotted as a function of angular space coordinates, theta and phi. So it could be field pattern or it could be power pattern. The field pattern is uh, always in the linear scale, whereas the power pattern can be in the linear scale or in the decimal scale. So we will be using spherical coordinate system uh, very uh, rigorously in this antenna theory and design course. So please get yourself familiar with uh, the spherical coordinate system which you have already studied in engineering electromagnetics. We will cover it in case if you have any doubts, we will discuss it in this class as well. Uh, so this is a field pattern and this is the power pattern in the linear scale and we see that if you plot the power pattern in the linear scale, uh, some of the information is kind of lost. So what we do is we use decibel scale. So this enhances the very weak signals if the dynamic range is very large, very often it will be in high gain antennas or in antenna arrays. So the maximum to minimum ratio will be very large. In that case, we use decibel scale. So the decibel scale enhances the information, especially in the weaker uh, radiation regions, and it gives much more uh, enhanced information compared to the linear scale, especially in the power pattern. Then we saw what are different type, what are different parts of a radiation pattern, like lobes. What is a major lobe? What is the minor lobe? What are minor lobes? What is the side lobe? What is the back lobe? We all we looked into this aspect. For example, this is the major lobe which has the maximum radiation. Uh, rest of them are minor lobes. Uh, the immediately ad adjacent, adjacent uh, lobes are the side lobes, as the name says. And finally, the 180 degree lobe is the back lobe. Uh, the, part, the pattern can be plotted either in the uh, polar plot or it can be uh, plotted in the rectangular plot also. Very often, it is a polar plot which is very widely used. 3D plots are becoming very popular, especially with the accessibility of 3D electromagnetic simulation tools. Uh, so we will be using extensively using 3D plots also. It's much more appealing and it's much more intuitive in a 3D plot than in a 2D plot or the uh, rectangular plot. Then we saw different types of radiation patterns like isotopic radiation pattern, uh, 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 direction radiation pattern and normal direction radiation pattern. As we have already seen, isotopic radiator is basically an hypothetical lossless antenna. So it's an ideal antenna, not physically realizable. But it is very useful reference for expressing directive properties of the actual antennas, real, real antennas. It, is very, it becomes a useful reference. So directional pattern, we saw it has efficiently, it radiates efficiently in some directions compared to the other directions. Omnidirectional antenna is a mixture of isotropic and directional pattern. Like in one plane, the radiation is uniform, whereas in the orthogonal plane, the radiation is directional. So we saw, uh, for example, this is a directional pattern, right? Uh, 
right? So this direction line term, the pattern for the pattern of a direction line term. And this is the pattern for omnidirectional antenna. So in the XY plane, in the, if you take the cross section of the XY plane, the radiation is uniform. Whereas if you take any orthogonal cross section, that is the XZ plane or YZ plane cross section, then the direction, the, the radiation is directional. So it's a combination of both isotropic, not combination, it has properties of both isotropic and directional. Then we saw mathematical representation of directional antenna. So this represents a mathematical representation of the directional antenna. Uh, it's very important to note that this expression is valid up to theta is equal to 90 degrees. Beyond theta is equal to 90 degrees, it is zero elsewhere. So this is how a directional antenna looks like. But one important point to note down here is this expression doesn't account for side lobes. Okay, especially beyond theta equal to 90 degrees. Any any side loop beyond theta equal to 90 degrees, this expression doesn't account for. So it's a it's an approximation. Like when any mathematical tool, like any analytical means of analyzing the antenna, this is an approximation. All analytical means are approximations. Only full wave 3D EM simulation is, approaches the realistic antenna. Rest all of them, even there is an approximation there also. But most of the other analytical techniques are all approximations. It depends on the approximations. Example is a horn antenna. So the horn antenna we saw is a directional antenna. It consists of side lobes as well, though the mathematical expression doesn't account for it. Omnidirectional antennas, we saw the expression for omnidirectional antenna is given by this expression. Once again, it doesn't account for the side lobes. Okay. And dipole antenna is uh, re actually uh, generates an omnidirectional pattern. We will see it in few of the after few lectures. We will see a dipole antenna actually generating the uh, omnidirectional pattern. Then we saw principal planes, especially applicable for linearly polarized antenna. Okay, so in what it says is uh, you don't need to know the 3D. See, getting three-dimensional plot is extremely difficult. It's time consuming. It's expensive. It's there are a lot of challenges. Simulation wise, you can get it, but I'm telling in terms of uh, real practical measurements. So, in the real practical measurements, it is easy to get 2D plots because you will be just varying your coordinates, antenna coordinates only along the one plane. So, it's very easy to get 2D plots. So, what the principal pattern says is that if you know the E plane and the H plane pattern, you can get information of the 3D plot. It's a very powerful uh, way of analyzing the antenna. So for uh, linearly polarized antenna, the E plane consists of that plane which consists. E plane is basically that plane which consists of electric field vector and the direction of maximum radiation. So for the antenna oriented in this direction here, well, what is the E plane? E plane is basically the plane Z and the X. X is the direction of maximum radiation. The electric field is oriented along the Z axis. So Z X plane is the E plane. Okay. And uh, what is H plane? So the H plane is given by the field, magnetic field is in the y direction, and uh, the maximum radiation is the x direction. So x y plane will be the H plane. So if you know 2D plots in E plane and H plane, you more or less get good, uh, good approximation to the antenna properties, which is essential for engineering design. Then we were looking into the field regions. So this is where we stop. We discussed this and we stopped it here. So there are three regions as we discussed: the reactive near field, radiating near field, and Fresnel for or the far uh, sorry front of the field or the far field. So good. Uh, these are the boundaries which are considered very often. The rule of thumb is to use this as the boundaries for these three regions, though it is not very well established or there are various criteria so the boundaries can change depending on criteria rule of thumb is the farther you are from the antenna uh, by this distance or beyond this distance you are most probably in the far field region so that's a good rule of thumb and very often we are interested in the far field region except in RFID applications where near field reactive near field becomes a primary region of interest so what is a reactive near field? It's a reactive near field is that region where the reactive field is dominant or the reactive field predominates. What is the uh, radiating near field? Radiating near field is that region where radiating fields are predominant. However, if you plot the field distribution, the field distribution is dependent on the distance from the antenna, which should not be the case. The far field is that region where the field distribution, it's radiate. First of all, it is radiating fields are prominent. In, in fact, not prominent. It is 
it's the only field that exists with the radiating layer field, radiating fields the reactive fields are almost uh, died down or it's almost exponentially diminished so but the important point here to note down is that the field distribution or the reactive field distribution is essentially independent of the distance from the antenna what do we mean by that let us take an example of a parabolic dish antenna okay so if you take a parabolic dish antenna and if you probe the electric field around this or very close to the antenna or around the antenna 360 degrees okay if you probe the electric field here and if you plot it you get something like this so this is theta okay theta is very theta is maximum theta is zero here this is theta equal to zero that is theta equal to zero theta equal to 90 degree theta equal to 90 degree and theta equal to 180 degree so you get an electric field distribution something like this what it's very interesting distribution you know means if you see the intuitive the intuitive uh, mind says that the theta has to be maximum here and the field has to be maximum theta equal to zero right but it is not the case if you see it is maximum somewhere at the edges or somewhere at these angles at these angles the field distribution is maximum whereas at theta equal to zero the field distribution is not maximum very interesting. So this is we are, we are the near field, reactive near field. So the reactive fields are dominant and the reactive fields are not easy to calculate and the reactive fields are not intuitive. That's what this graph says. Then we move into the radiating near field. So once you move up, you start moving away from the antenna and start probing the antenna somewhere in this region. Okay, where D is the dimension of the parabolic dish, maximum dimension of the parabolic dish. And in this region, radiating near field, we start looking into some kind of a radiation pattern. We see, okay, yes, theta equal to zero, theta equal to zero, there is maximum radiation happening, or the field is maximum. Yes, it kind of makes sense. But if you take this plot, or if you, if you probe the field here, it will be close to this. If you probe the field here, it will be close to this. That means this pattern is kind of changing. It is varying with the distance. So that indicates, so the variation of the pattern over the distance indicates that we are in the radiating near field. And finally, if you are far away from the uh, antenna, quite very far away from the antenna, then we get a very neat antenna radiation pattern, which is very intuitive, which says that yes, the theta equal to zero, there is maximum radiation. And uh, this pattern will not change with the distance. Okay, so as you move away, it gets refined and refined, no doubt, but uh, it will not change as per engineering approximations, it will not change. So these are the three near fields for a parabolic dish antenna. So it's not at all intuitive. It's, uh, it's not intuitive to me, at least, this field, whereas this field is much more intuitive. So this is the three regions, reactive near field, radiating near field, and far field region. Okay, now we go into, uh, please stop me if you have any clarification, if you need any clarifications or if you have any doubts, please stop me, uh, I think when you feel free. Okay, next let we go into radian and steridian, definition of radian and steridian, very important definitions. Radian you are all aware of, from your, your mathematic, uh, mathematics you are all aware of that what is the radian. Radian is that in a circle basically, okay, it is that angle which subtends an R of length radius, right? S is equal to R theta is the arc length. When S is equal to radius, that is the arc length becomes the radius, that angle is referred to as the one radian. Since there are two pi, since the circumference of the circle is two pi R, and R is the length of the arc length for one radian, we have two pi R by R, which is two pi radians in a circle. So in a circle, we have two pi radians, which we all know of it. And this is the definition of a radian. This is for a two dimensional uh, figure. Now, if you, if you extrapolate it for a three dimensional uh, object, we get uh, for a sphere. So if you take a sphere and one steridian now is the definition. And the definition of one steridian is it is that cone angle. Okay, it is a cone angle. It is not two dimensional angle now. It is solid angle now. It is now a solid angle. It is a cone angle. It is that cone angle or which it is that solid angle which subtends an area equal to R square, but R is the radius of the sphere. 
Here the arc length was equal to the radius of the circle. Here the area is equal to r squared or r is the radius of the sphere. So that is the definition of a steridian. Okay, please go through this once again because steridian will be very widely used in this course. Uh, the solid angle steridian will be very widely used in this course. So please go through it once again. So it is basically that cone angle which subtends an area of r square where r is the radius of the sphere. What is the area of the sphere? The area of the sphere is 4 pi r square, right? And r square is subtended by one steridian. So how many steridians are there? So 4 pi r square by r square, which is 4 pi steridians. So a sphere has 4 pi steridian solid angle. Very important to remember or very important to note down here. Okay. So we will be using spherical coordinate system as we have seen in the previous slides. So one important parameter here is the element of unit area and element of unit solid angle. It's a, uh, so what is the element of unit area? If you take an infin infinitesimally small area and we have seen it becomes a rectangle, one side will be r d theta, another side will be r sin theta d phi. So the area of unit element area which has a normal in the radial axis will be r square sin theta d theta d phi. Right, we have already seen this. If, please go through your uh, engineering electromagnetics, or we can discuss it once again. If some, if some of you have doubts, so we, we this is very important parameter. Element of unit area is r square sin theta d theta d phi. Now, if you take element of unit solid angle, you take an infinitesimally small solid angle uh, whose normal is in the radial direction, then that cone angle that element of solid angle will have will be r square sin theta d theta d phi by r square which is sin theta d theta d phi d omega it's called d omega so d a is r square sin theta d theta d phi whereas d omega is sin theta d theta d phi okay so this is the element of unit area and this is the element of unit solid angle very important to note down in a spherical coordinate system Okay, so that covers radiation pattern. We have seen loads, we have seen types of radiation patterns, principal patterns, field regions, radian and steridian. We have not gone heavily into mathematics. We have just noted and tried to understand the different you know, different types of radiation patterns, definitions of uh, radiation patterns. We were, trying, we were trying to qualitatively understand it without going into the quantitative nature. So now we will go into a very important definition, two important definitions in my opinion radiation power density and radiation intensity. Understanding these two topics or uh, uh, concepts uh, is very essential if we want to uh, in our future courses, in our future lectures. So radiation power density is what we Professor, excuse me, you are going fast. Would you please just uh, slow a little bit? Okay, I'm going Thanks. fast. Okay. Thanks okay. so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the feedback. Uh, so I will try to go slow a little bit. So radiation power density and radiation intensity are two key uh, uh, topics which we will have to look into and uh, understanding them is very important. So we will go with radiation power density and uh, then we will cover radiation intensity. Okay, let us go to radiation power density. So we are all aware of that electric field and magnetic field together uh, has power in it, right? There is power associated in an electromagnetic wave and it is given by instantaneous pointing vector. So what do the instantaneous pointing vector says? In instantaneous pointing vector says, so the power density, very important to note, it's a power density is given by E cross H. So instantaneous pointing vector given by power density watt per meter square and instantaneous electric field intensity is given by volt per meter and instantaneous magnetic field, and field intensity is given by ampere per meter. Now it's a power density, very important to note down. Very often we forget the units and we don't know, we get confused whether it's the actual power or it's power density, it's power density. Now if you want the total power, so the total power is we integrate the power density over the surface, entire surface, right? Uh, so we take the normal component of the surface and integrate the power density and we get the total power radiated or total power associated with an electromagnetic field in a field of electromagnetic energy. Now, 
if for time varying fields what happens for the time varying fields it is very often important to note that uh, the instantaneous power density which was defined by the instantaneous values here is not very helpful what is helpful is the average power density because the fields are varying with time and uh, instantaneous power density is also varying with time and we want an average value so that's what we want that's more useful as a, for engineers so what we do we integrate the instantaneous pointing vector over one period of time and divide it by the period of time so for as we have already seen we are already looking into time varying fields so the time varying fields is very often uh, helpful to analyze using phasors we are already aware of the phasors so the instantaneous electric field intensity is a function of time can be expressed if it is sinusoidally time varying so we can express it as a part of the phasor and the time varying field right so this is a phasor component now the and the real part of it gives the instantaneous electric field similarly the phasor component of the magnetic field and the real part of it gives the instantaneous magnetic field intensity if you take the uh, what you want we want the average power density right so average power density is we have to take the uh, cross product of e cross h we have to take the cross product of e and h so if you take the curl uh, sorry if you take the cross product of e and h uh, you get you have to work we, are, we will see it in the tutorial how do we get this expression so we get an expression very interesting expression that the power density is given by so the real there are two components here two parts here there is this part first part and the second part on the second part it is interesting to observe that it is varying with twice the frequency in your ac circuits you would have already done some kind of tutorials and you would have come across that there is two components of a power one is the dc part and another is the twice the, is an ac part which is varying twice the frequency and if you take the average and we are interested in the average power density so we integrate the, so we want to take the time average of it so if you want to take the time average so the second part becomes zero right because it is varying twice the frequency and it is sinusoidally varying so the average part becomes zero and this is the time independent part so what are we left out with so we are left out with only this part which is the average power density so the average power density is given by half real part of e cross h conjugate very important very useful analytical tool because if you want to calculate the average power density from the instantaneous values from sign sign expressions it becomes very tedious it becomes extremely tedious i have tried it and it becomes very tedious but if you know the phasors it be, the life becomes very simple so you take half real part of e cross h conjugate and you are already uh, you you automatically get average power density it's worth remembering this it will be very helpful in not just in this course it will be helpful in general Half real part of e cross h conjugate gives you the average power density for time varying fields. Remember, e and h are phasors. Okay, so what happens to the total power once again? Total power radiated or total power associated with electromagnetic field is given by the average power density integrated over the surface, total surface, over the normal component of the surface. So half real part of e cross h conjugate integrated over the surface gives the total power. Anyways, we will not be doing uh, any of these. Don't worry, we will not be taking the electromagnetic in uh, electromagnetic engineering course, and we will not be solving any of the uh, those surface integrals or volume integrals. Just, just more. This is more of uh, introduction, so I am just giving it more of an introduction. Okay, let us calculate for isotropic power, isotropic antenna. Why are we solving it for isotropic antenna? Because first thing, it is a reference. It is used as a reference for most of the uh, practical antennas. Second thing is, it is the simplest antenna which is easy to calculate. It gives you an idea of what's happening. So that's why we are taking an isotopic radiator. So isotopic radiator, we want to calculate what is our goal. Our goal is to calculate the power density. Okay, average power density to be very specific of a radiate of an isotopic antenna. So what is an isotopic antenna? It's an ideal source that radiates equally in all directions. Right? We have already seen this. Because of the symmetry in radiation, it has to radiate equally in all directions. It has only radial component, and the radiation uh, is not function of spherical coordinates. Okay, it has only radial component, and it is uniformly radiating uh, in all directions from the center of the sphere. Antenna is placed in the center of the sphere. 
Now the total power, what is the total power radiated by that antenna? So the total power radiated by the antenna is the surface integral of average uh, power density in, uh, integrated over the surface. So if you take the sphere, so 0 to 2 pi is the phi variation, theta variation from 0 to pi. So this is the average power density, it is uniform, okay? And into the element of unit area, what is the element of unit area? We have already seen the element of unit area is r sin square, r, r square sin theta d3 d5, which is the component, normal component is in the radial direction. So you integrate this, you don't have to do the mathematics, it's much more intuitive than that. See, basically what we are doing is we are integrating the average power density over the surface. What is the surface area of the sphere? 4 pi r square. And since this is uniform, you can take this outside the integral. So, so it will become W naught into the surface. So the surface area is nothing but 4 pi r square. That's as simple as that. So 4 pi r square into average power density will be the total power radiated power, total power radiated by the isotropic antenna. And if you want to know the power density, because that is our goal, to know the power density. So to calculate the power density, all we want is you, you divide the total power radiated, sorry, yeah, total power radiated by the 4 pi r square, by the total area, you get average power density. So worth remembering this. You don't have to remember, it's much more intuitive. So because it is uniformly radiating in all directions, so the power per unit area is nothing but total power by total area. So that's as simple as that. So this is for the isotropic radiator. Okay, so this is the average power density for an isotropic radiator. Okay, so now we go to, so that was regarding power density. Now we go to another important uh, concept, power radiation intensity. So that was radiation power density, what we have covered. Power per unit area, that's all you have to remember. Power per unit area is power density. Power per unit solid angle is radiation intensity. So what is radiation intensity? Radiation intensity in a given direction is nothing but the power radiated from an antenna per unit solid angle, not per unit area. We, uh, why do we want radiation intensity? We will look into it. Basically, it is the power radiated per unit solid angle. So power radiated per unit solid angle and unit solid angle, what is the definition of unit solid angle? Unit area by R square from the definition of, can anybody tell from where this, this definition comes from? Steridian. Steridian, exactly. So this comes from, yes, this comes from the steridian. So if you take power, what is power per unit area? Power per unit area, we have already seen it as power density, right? Average power density. So this is nothing but average power density into R square is radiation intensity. It is as simple as that. So power per unit solid angle is radiation intensity. Uh, unit solid angle is nothing but unit area by R square. And power per unit area is power density. So R square into power density, R square into power density is nothing but radiation intensity. So if you know power density, you multiply it by R square with radiation intensity. So worth remembering it, power density is denoted by W in this course, and that is nothing but power per unit area, which has units watt per meter square. Radiation intensity is denoted by U. It is power, once again, it is not field. It is power per unit solid angle, which is given by watt per steady. Okay, so what is the total power radiated? Total power radiated is very simple. Uh, we have already seen total power radiated is nothing but average power density into the unit element of unit area. So if you take the R square and club it with W R average power density from the definition of radiation intensity, it is nothing but U. This is nothing but U, radiation intensity. So this term becomes radiation intensity U, okay, into element of unit solid angle. This is the element of unit solid angle, sin theta d theta d5. So all you have to do is you have to integrate, which is intuitive, right? So you integrated the average power density over the entire sphere, entire, entire surface, surface integral, whereas this is the angular integral. So you integrate the radiation intensity because it is a power per unit angle, and you integrate the, over the entire solid angle of the complete sphere. So that gives you the total power radiation. It's very simple, it's as simple as that. Or you can derive it. So if you remember this, you can derive it from there also. So let us take once again for an isotropic source. Isotropic source is much more simpler. So what happens to an isotropic source? Total power radiated is given by uh, its uniform radiation intensity because it's an isotropic. It is uniformly radiating in all directions now. 
okay it is not in unit element area it is in directions so it's uniformly radiating in all directions integrated with uh, the solid angle complete solid angle over the entire sphere so you can take it outside the integral because it is uniform and if what is how many steradians we have we have already seen in a sphere there are four pi steradians right so four pi into units are going to the radiation intensity average not uh, yeah it's average radiation intensity will be the total power radiated so what is the radiation intensity of an isotropic antenna it is p radiated by 4 pi otherwise if you know this one if you know this one you multiply it by r square you get the same result you have to get the same result so p radiated by 4 pi r by r square into r square r square r square cancels so p radiated by 4 pi so that is the uh, radiation intensity of a uh, isotropic antenna isotropic source Okay, so we covered two important topics: radiation power density and radiation intensity. At this point of time, you please uh, uh, go through it once again. But the important point at the end to remember is power density is power per unit area. Power radiation intensity is this one. Power density is power per unit area, watt per meter square. Radiation intensity is power per unit solid angle, watt per steradian. Important to note that U also is a power. It's a power factor. Okay, sorry, it's a power factor. Okay. So we come to the last uh, final topic. Any clarifications? Any clarifications required so far? What we have covered? Or is it okay? Or should I go a little bit slower? Or is it okay? Is this speed okay? Uh, it's okay. Okay, so we will take the next topic, which is beam width. Uh, so the final topic in probably we will uh, we will cover this beam width and we will wrap up today's lecture. I don't want to take the next lecture now because it becomes half and half. So what is beam width? So beam width. There are two definitions for the beam width. Okay, uh, one is a half power beam width. The name says it is half power beam width, and first null beam width. Again, the name says first null beam width. So the first null beam width is that angle. It is that angular separation between the first nulls in the pattern. So the uh, of course we are interested in the direction of maximum radiation. So the immediate nulls around the uh, radiation direction of radiation maximum radiation will be the first nulls, and the angular separation between the first nulls will be the first null beam width. Half power beam width. It is the angular separation between two directions. In which the radiation intensity. Now we have know what the radiation intensity is. Radiation it is one half of the value of the maximum. We will take an example and we will look into it. So these are the two definitions for the beam width: half power beam width and two and first null beam width. So beam width is a very important parameter figure of merit of an antenna. There is always a trade-off between beam width and the side low. So if you make the if you want to try to make the beam width as small as possible, your side low will increase. And if you try to make the side lobe as small as possible, your beam width will increase. So there is always a trade-off between the beam width and the side lobe. So as engineers, that is our goal, as that is our aim to optimize the system for the requirement. And we, especially if you are working on radars, the beam width of an antenna determines the resolution capacity of the radar. Of uh, very often the typical radars that we use or the conventional radars. So the resolution capacity is determined by the beam width of the antenna. So let us take some examples, and then we will try to understand exactly what we have discussed so far. Sir, uh, one query, sir. Yes, please. Sir, the last point. Can you go to the previous slide, sir? Yes, please. Sir, the last point which says it describes the resolution capability of the antenna. Are we talking about the cross range resolution, sir? Uh, I am not. I am not much working on on radars, but what I understand is it determines. Uh, there are two resolutions, right? One is Between the targets, if one target is behind the other target, then it is the time that yes. determines the resolution. Pulse, it is a pulse width that determines the resolution there. Here we are determining the resolution where the two targets are in the same plane, same cross section plane. At same range, and yes, sir. at the same range, at the same range. That's the right that, way to put. That it. is the cross range resolution, sir. Yes. That's a cross range resolution. Okay, so that that's a same range. Yes. Right. Thank you. Thank you. So we will take some examples and we will try to determine what the beam width is, whatever we have defined, whatever we have discussed so far. 
so we will take a 2d cross section of a 3d pattern okay so let us take for example the yz cross section so if you take the yz cross section so we have the maximum direction of radiation here in the z along the z direction and then where is the nulls so we have two nulls here so this is the first null and this is the second null so this beam width is the first null beam width this is referred to as the first null beam width whereas if you take the half the value it's very important note that this is plotted in, uh, there is a mistake here this is not field pattern this is power pattern okay so the power pattern plotted in the linear scale so if you plot the power pattern in the linear scale uh, if you take the maximum value and take the half the value and determine the directions along which the radiation is half of the maximum value those that that the angle separation between those two directions is the half power beam width so it's a name is clearly indicated from the name it is half power beam width and the other is a first null beam width so let us take different case scenarios that may come suppose you are dealing with a field pattern in the linear scale in this case it is 1 by root 2 times the maximum value right in the normalized scale of the field so the half power corresponds to 1 by root 2 times the maximum value so that corresponds to the half power beam width if it is the power pattern in the linear scale it is the half of the value can anybody tell me what will be in the db scale what should be the values here for the half power beam width in the db scale i think most of you are aware of it anybody can tell me minus 3 db minus 3 db yes so as you are all aware of it so its minus 3 db angle will be the half power beam width in the uh, db scale okay it is it's important to note, note that all these three patterns are for the same antenna hence you should get the same value for all these three patterns okay let us take one example one tutorial example and then we will one tutorial example and then we will wrap today's class so there is a normalized radiation intensity is given of an antenna okay it is intensity radiation intensity u is given by this expression remember to note that this expression is valid up to theta equal to 90 degrees beyond theta equal to 90 degree it is zero it is assumed to be zero it's not given but we if it is not given we assume it to be zero now uh, determine the half power beam width and first null beam width so that's our goal so suppose you are an engineer and somebody gives you uh, this or you yourself have calculated have determined that the radiation intensity is given by this expression of an antenna you want to know half power beam width and first null beam width in the future classes we will see what is the importance of half power beam width and first null beam width how it is related to directivity and gain for time being we will calculate only half power beam width and the first null beam width of an antenna whose radiation intensity is given by this expression now can anybody tell me is just looking at this expression can you tell me what is the radiation pattern of this antenna is it direct is it first of all isotropic is it directional is it omnidirectional can anybody tell me just by looking at this expression no more information is given for you it's directional it's directional very good anybody else wants to try why it's directional Because the theta is uh, it, theta, it's the uh, the reason when uh, the directional there is no minor lobes. That's why the theta uh, defined that. Yes, uh, it's partially right. We cannot conclude that there are no minor lobes in this expression. But if we plug in the values of theta here, theta equal to zero, you get the maximum value of the expression. Uh, if you plug in theta equal to 90 degree, the expression becomes zero. So that kind of indicates you're right. It kind of indicates that the, the direction that the pattern is directional. Is it clear to everyone? Just by looking at this expression, you can say whether it is directional or it's omnidirectional. Plug in the values of theta and you get uh, a kind of, you can plot it for a few discrete values of theta and then see whether it is directional or non-directional. Okay, and now let us move on to the task of calculating the half power beam width and first beam width. So how do we do it? So this is how the pattern looks like in the 3D plot. If you plot it in MATLAB, you take this expression and vary theta and phi, and phi, it is symmetric or with phi, therefore it will be symmetric with phi, so phi 0 to 360 degree it is symmetric. So if you plot, if you vary theta, you get a 3D plot, very neat 3D plot. 
let's see it actually indicates it actually includes one minotaur also okay so let us see this is a 2d plot so if you take the cross section say x z sorry y z cross section or x z cross section you will get a 2d plot now the goal is to calculate the half power members and first time how do we do it okay it is very straightforward you see we are working with the radiation intensity right it is a power so let us first start with half power beam width so for half power beam width it's the linear scale it was not in the db scale it is in the linear scale now since it is in the linear scale so for first we have to find out that angle at which the entire value becomes half because it is power not field suppose if, we, if it is given field sometimes it is explicitly given as field you have to calculate it as 0.707 here but now it is a power uh, it's radiation intensity which is the power and hence we want to find out that angle at which the radiation intensity is half the value of the maximum so this expression has to be half so if you take the square root of it so this expression has to be 0.707 how do you solve this expression there are many ways of solving this expression you can use mathematical non linear mathematical equations non linear mathematical techniques to solve this expression iterative techniques or you can use matlab very simple straightforward just vary the value of theta h solve this expression see where it crosses 0.707 those are the values of theta h very straightforward you can take it as an exam homework and try to do it so you can solve it using matlab or you can solve it using any of the iterative techniques and you get value what is the value end value you get theta h that is the first theta there are multiple solutions to it will there be multiple solution i think i doubt there will not be multiple solutions there will be one solution there will be one more solution which will be 360 degree minus this one so there will be only two solutions so the first solution is 14.32 degrees is the first solution that you get so this is what this is see we know that theta at, at theta equal to 0 it is maximum we know that right because we plug the values of theta equal to 0 and we get the expression to be 1 which is the maximum value that this expression can take so this is so what we got is 14.2538 uh, 32 degrees so that is one of the expression similarly because of the symmetry nature there will be another angle which is minus 14.32 degrees or 360 minus 14.32 degrees so half power beam width is what half power beam width is twice the 14.32 degrees so half power beam width is twice the 14.32 degrees so you will be able to calculate the half power beam width in this methodology so you can use the matlab and solve it and calculate the half power beam width so next we will, we want to calculate the first null beam width so first null beam width as the name says we have to calculate the nulls here so with the radiation intensity we have to equate the expression to the zero because we want the nulls it's in the linear scale so we want the, we want the null the directions along which the nulls exist so there are two solutions or multiple solutions Well, the first two solutions are the cos theta it becomes zero. That is one of the solution. There you have 90 degrees, so you will solve it and you get 90 degrees. The second solution is cos three three theta equal to zero, and there you get 90 by 90 by three, which is 30 degrees. So you have to take 30 degrees as the first null because we are interested in the first null beam width. So the first null occurs at 30 degrees, and because of the symmetry, it will be twice this angle, which is 60 degrees. so that will be the uh, first null beam width so the first null beam width will be 60 degrees so this is the first null 30 degrees coming at here and this is a minus 30 degrees so 60 degrees will be the first null beam so note that there will be a null at 90 degree also how will we get that that we got it from this uh, solution so and it is verified in the uh, plot pattern also so there will be a null in the uh, 90 degrees direction and this expression consist of a, actually represents even one of the side lobes up to 90 degree up to theta equal to 90 degree it can represent the side lobes uh, beyond theta equal to 90 degree it cannot capture the side lobes or may or the minor lobes okay so this is how you can solve the uh, half power beam width and first null beam width probably this expressions may change in your real applications this expression may change but very often what i have observed is if you use a simulation tool you will directly get half power beam width and first null beam width calculated for you so life becomes even more simpler there 
but if you know the expression for the antenna analytical expression for the antenna you know how to calculate it right so it's as straightforward as what we have seen so far okay so in summary what all will we cover in summary so we have seen radiation pattern and different types of radiation what is the definition of radiation pattern basically we have seen what are the different types of radiation patterns we have seen isotropic direction normal direction patterns uh different regions uh, like uh, what the antenna region is divided into reacting near field radiating near field and far field region definition of ceridian very important difference between radiation power density and radiation intensity so there is a difference between them you have to know what is the difference between them and half power beam width and first beam width and we took an example of how to calculate the half power beam width and first beam width also okay so this completes the lecture today's lecture we have still 7 minutes to go so if you have any clarifications or you want to discuss whatever we have covered we can do it i don't want to take the next lecture now because it becomes piece wise so we can discuss or we, if you have any clarifications we can go through those clarifications hello hi sir uh, can hello yes please Uh, sir, can we assess the uh, presentation? Uh, presentation, I would like not to give it because you are. Uh, we are already calculating uh, what you what are we doing. Okay, there are two reasons why I would not like to share it. So the first reason is we are already recording the uh, lectures, right? So you can always access to these lectures in the MS Teams. Second reason is most of the slides I have adopted from the Balanis. So if you have Balanis textbook, it is very often. the same figures and the same examples and the same content so what i'm going through is i'm trying to interpret those um, figures and content uh, and i'm trying to make it as simple as possible so these are the two reasons why i would not like to share the presentation so is that okay or is it, is it still some queries required in that okay sir okay okay thank you but please refer balanis and i'm mostly referring the balanis so that would be a very good uh, and for the lecture videos it is already being recorded so you can always access it in ms teams any other queries any other clarifications sir yes please uh, last class you said that uh, mid exam and end exam with open book right yes yeah so uh, that's why no need to memorize uh, any of relations uh, just to uh, understand and uh, how to apply perfect so you don't have to memorize any of the expressions uh, most often uh, most probably the exam will not be even uh, tutorial based so the exam will be simulation based cad based simulation based so it will most probably test your cad skills rather than your analytical skills but we will cover analytical skills in the tutorial so i don't want to miss it so i will cover the analytical skills in the tutorial but the examination will be mostly testing your cad based skills okay sir okay okay thank you by the way uh, uh, you can all start accessing to the cad uh, tool uh, uh, one of the student has successfully got it done from icc you can discuss with him i think he uh, patnaik uh, told he will contact with you kalyan patnaik so you can discuss with him and you can try to get access to the cad tool uh, it's very essential you start practicing the cad tool from now itself uh, it will be very helpful for your assignments and for the midterm and end term examination uh, professor cad tool is the same of cst it's cst it's a cst micro studio Okay. Okay. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Any other clarifications? Any other doubts? Any other discussions? Any discussion you want to have? We still have five more minutes in the class. Excuse me, sir. Yes, please. Sir, uh, will there be any class on how to use this CST, sir? There will be two. Uh, there will be many lectures where I will be trying to use CST Micro Studio to actually design uh, dipole antenna, patch antenna, and uh, uh, horn antenna and uh, arrays. 
So there will be few lectures that will be covering CST Micro Studio, at least the basis of CST Micro Studio. But what I would like to personally share with you is that there are a lot of YouTube videos available on how to use antenna simulation in CST Micro Studio. So that is a very useful tool. Even I am referring those uh, YouTube videos. So that will be a very helpful tool also. Right, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir? Yes, please. What's the time uh, when we will uh, start uh, tutorials? Tutorials probably after uh, maybe four or five lectures, lectures we may start the tutorial, I guess. Okay, thanks. Any other clarifications or doubts? Okay, so I will be there for another three minutes in the meeting. And uh, if you don't have any clarifications, you can uh, carry on and go to the next class, uh, prepare for the next class. And if some of you have doubts or clarifications, I'll be there for another three minutes and we can discuss together. 